Welcome back to another riveting episode of Perpetually Patek. I'm Brian, this is Tim, and today we are playing favorites. No watches prior to 2000, three watches each. We're gonna do a little bit of a head-to-head. -head. Okay, so this is a lot of fun because I got to pick the watches I like most, not necessarily clickbaity stuff. So naturally, I start with the ultimate niche watch, which is a high horology alarm. Traditionally, alarm watch has been underestimated, thought of as a sort of like Volks complication. This is interesting because in 2019, Patek took its Calatrava pilot line, and we've got that aesthetic. We've got the cross-hatched strap. We've got the clevis style counterweighted buckle. We've got the look of the numerals and the dial and the fonts. Fully loomed, very handsome, super legible. It's still a travel timer, but now we have a digital alarm that can be set to 15-minute increments. It uses a minute repeater strike governor on the back, and uh, large wire gongs. It is sonorous, it is loud enough to wake you up, which I think is like the go, no-go for an alarm watch. And it's got nice gait, a nice cadence to it. It does sound like a minute repeater when it's going. Plus, the fact that you can set it to a 24-hour scale means it knows the difference between, say, 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. So it's actually a pretty smart watch without being a smart watch. For me, the big differentiator was the minute repeater style hammer. Um, as you mentioned, it sounds exactly like a minute repeater, except it goes for a very long amount of time. This was their take on an uncompromised alarm. Many other brands have produced alarm watches in the past, but those watches sound like a rattle. All the energy is used in one shot. It feels like it's vibrating. It's like a burst. Exactly. This, it's well-paced, it's musical, it's lyrical, and leave it to Patek to produce what is an opulent, and rich sounding alarm watch. And here's the thing, like, I think you could make the case that either one of these is like your everyday watch. This is a calendar that's steel and very water resistant. It's well loomed. This is a travel time that's also an alarm mm -hmm. that's well loomed. Now you're not gonna swim with this, but at the same time, this isn't gonna wake you up for your flight. So I wanted to sort of pick my watches as complements to each other. And granted, this is very ambitious. This is over $220,000. It's priced like a minute repeater. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a flagship watch. It's not easy to understand. A lot of people are going to say alarm watches are cheap watches, or it looks like a 5524. And mm -hmm. all of that is true. But I think that if you are a Patek collector, you already understand there is a qualitative difference between how Patek does something and how the rest of the industry does. There's also ease of use, yeah. right? Like this is all able to be easily operated through the crown. Um, you've got several different crowns here, two of which are for the travel time function, and then the rest are for setting the watch and for the alarm. Yeah, and I think the great thing about the alarm is that a little bit like a minute repeater, it's a go, no-go, so it's gotta be fully energized mm -hmm. for you to arm it. So it won't let you arm the alarm if it's not already wound and ready to go. So it won't give you a false sense of security. And then it's probably the most distinctive looking watch that Patek makes. I don't think there are too many others where you can completely cover the dial and still know what it is. It's like a naval mine. It's got all these little contact strikers ready to blow you out of the water with its alarm. So I'm gonna get started with something a little bit more simple. Here we have the reference 5196P, P meaning platinum. So this watch has actually since been discontinued. Uh, 37 millimeters in size, very thin, an homage to the reference 96. The platinum variation for me is my favorite version of the watch. You have this sort of two-tone styling to the dial. That's really due to the difference in the finishing between the outer track here and the inner. Uh, Breguet numerals, um, you know, able to be dressed up, dressed down. For me, just a fantastic all-around timepiece. And what I really like here is that this is proof that you don't need to own some grand complication or mm -hmm. a Nautilus to have a true Patek Philippe. Not only is this one of their longest running model lines, this really is the heir to the 96, which dates back to 1932. First watch designed by the Stearns for Patek. Uh, depending on who you ask first to have a reference number, mm -hmm. this is a really important foundational watch. And then in terms of what you get, there's not a lot of it, but everything's the best possible. White gold, Breguet, Arabic numerals, and hands. You've got those two different shadings of the finish with the opaline and the brushed. You've got the dimple style minutes track outboard. The balance is perfect. Cut it down the middle, bilateral symmetry, thin, fine. Really the only watch on the table I would consider a unisex option. So it's really, uh, it, it's the watch that opens up Patek Philippe to a lot of folks. Those may be buying their first, buying their only, or looking at one that's suitable for a lady, so there's a lot of flexibility here. And they produced this watch in four variations. You had white gold, rose gold, yellow gold, and platinum. 
the Platinum was the only one with a differentiated dial and was also priced significantly more expensive than the others. But it was also the rarest. So for me, it was very often that splurge watch. And so you don't see too many of them on wrists or in collections or even that many that trade. And you were really paying that money, obviously, for the for the rarity of the Platinum. Um, that does have a little bit more heft of it, but also for that dial differentiator that you know that this is the Platinum version. And for me, the, the those Breguet numerals are just as good as it gets. Now, one feature we've got a couple of times across the table here is the diamond between the lugs. Mm -hmm. So if you're new to Patek Philippe, in the 21st century, the diamond between the lugs down at six o'clock means you're looking at a platinum watch. And to me, that is the most sublime use of a gem on a man's watch that I have yet to encounter. I, I don't think that is even remotely controversial in a world where ice on a watch stirs passions. Everyone seems to love the diamond between the lugs. The story that I heard was that Mr. Terry Stern put one on a watch for his dad, and they loved it so much that they decided to start using it regularly on all the platinum pieces that were delivered from the factory. That's a very cool fact. You know, I learned something new every day. Brian just taught me something I didn't know. So this is a lot of fun because it's, in my opinion, one of those things that you just have to have if you're a Patek fan. Uh, once you start getting deeper into the brand, you realize there are some signatures. The annual calendar, their own invention. 1996, mm -hmm. a famous first. The Nautilus. Easily their most iconic mm -hmm. sports watch design. To have them both in this uh, 5726-1A, this is the Dash 14 that came out in 2019. You've got the blue gradient dial, which is very much of the moment, but also has deep roots with the Nautilus dating back to 76. But it's got this wonderful aperture style calendar where you've got the day, the date, the month, it's beautifully balanced. You can cut it down the center. Again, it's got that reflective symmetry that we had on the, mm -hmm. the 5196, and then I don't know how to describe this other than to say that this to a 5711 is like an offshore to a Royal Oak. It's just a little bit burlier. It's more sturdy. It's got a bit more durability and heft to it. It's only a little larger by measurement being 40.5, but there's a real perception that this is a bulkier, heavier, uh, hardier watch. No, for sure. And I mean, I, for me, the diff, you know, you had the 5980 in the past which is still made in rose gold on a bracelet and rose gold on a strap. And then you had the 5711 and 5712. Um, but in the past, you had the 5980, which was, as you mentioned, a little bit thicker, a little bit bulkier, but still the same dimensions. And so customers today that are looking for something now a little bit thicker than a 5712, since the 5711 is no longer around, this really is uh, the right option. Yeah. I also think that of all the complications that are in the Nautilus, the annual calendar offers the most utility. Like it's, it's, it's a complication that everybody really will use. Yeah, I realized when I was putting together this trio, I needed three things. I needed one all-time great, I needed a travel time watch, I needed a sports watch, and I needed the calendar. This scratch is the itch. I got my sports watch, I got my loom, I can swim with it, it's 120 meters, I got the calendar, and not just a calendar, but the annual calendar. Plus, uh, what's really nice about this timepiece is, while it is maybe an offshore to the 5711's Royal Oak, it's not as bulky as an offshore. I mean, you look at that, it's thin, it's flat, you could wear it as a dress watch, it doesn't limit you. And that kind of versatility is a rare thing. Plus, you know, a lot, it's not commonly known, but Patek does talk about accuracy. Mm -hmm. And for a watch like this, they're talking no worse than minus three plus two a day. That's well beyond chronometer. So it's fine as well as versatile. Yeah. All right. Moving right along. A very different school of steel now. This is the new school of steel, Patek. So launched within the last few years, here we have the 5935A. So this is their latest iteration of the World Time Chronograph. So 41 millimeters, now an updated size, uh, with a salmon guilloche stamp dial, um, definitely a more modern approach to the world time. Um, world time is a very storied past for Patek Philippe. I mean, it's one of their most known complications. They've been producing it for a long period of time, and we've seen it in several different watches now. Um, very easy to use through this single button pusher up here at the top left. Um, they obviously have since added a chronograph function to the world time here and just overall fantastic watch. Now on stainless steel, uh, which makes it a little bit more casual, a little bit lighter, and I think that it now serves more of that casual dress watch that we've seen the brand moving in that direction. Um, but it has the same sort of case lug profile as the 5230 did or 5231 does now, which is the world time 
without. It, it's got the a really nice. It's got a really nice step lug profile, which gives it a little bit of a vintage, vintage look. feel for sure. That's what exactly. But you have you know luminescent hands and indices here, so easy to read. You can read it at night, and just again for me, just it checks all the right boxes. And a couple of things going on here. For one. You get to see, there are still Nautilus models in steel being made. Like, the 5711's dead, but there's mm -hmm. still still uh, steel Nautilus out there. But with the 5711 being discontinued in steel, it's still available for special order in different metals. But the budget for that 20% of Patek production that's going to be steel, it can be spent in other ways if it's not going mm -hmm. into 5711s. So we see things like the 5212, 5935A. We start mm -hmm. seeing watches that are not explicitly sports watches being made in that more versatile steel material. Exactly. So you, you know, you're, you're having many more watches like this that I would say sort of are in between the more traditional styling of Patek Philippe from the early to even mid 2000s, and then modern sport, similar to the Nautilus that you see here on the table, right? So um, they can easily be dressed up, dressed down. They offer different straps now um, to really change the overall look and feel of the piece. And you know, again, I I like the the stamped guilloche on the dial. I think it adds more character to the watch. I'll also say this, you know, this is the kind of watch where it's got its own reference number, and it could have easily been the 5930A, but they made enough changes mm -hmm. that it became the 5935A. That's down to the steel case, mm -hmm. that's down to changing the pattern from a guilloche to what they call a carbon print mm -hmm. on the dial. It's the addition of the blackened indices and hands for the higher contrast. It's the outer dial also in salmon. Slightly bigger in size. It is bigger. It, it's different enough that it gets its own reference, so it stands alone. I don't think it's gonna have a really long production Run, I think it will remain fairly unique, and at mm -hmm. some point, uh, we're probably going to see the calling of time on that model. So I think it's really special. But just as we saw a very short run for the 6007A, yeah. I, I think this steel Patek non-sports watch is going to be something we come back to as one of the greats of the era and a really short. I think this run. will see a different dial configuration. You know, right now you have the 5930, which is the in platinum, which is the call it predecessor to this watch, or I guess it's not really a predecessor since it's still around, but with the green dial. Yeah. So same complication, but a little bit smaller. And so I do think that you're gonna see the 5930 go away uh, and to be fully replaced by the 5935. And then perhaps, you know, we'll see a different dial, a dial configuration or even a different metal in this watch, right? You know, you haven't seen a rose one before. And so, you know, could I see them producing this watch in rose gold? Of course. And so now you've got your chronograph there, but it's actually more than that. It's a world time, it's a flyback chrono, it's loomed, it's a very sporty watch. Here, I wanted to go with something that sort of appealed to the New Yorker in me. And so I've got something that I wouldn't quite call it vintage, not yet. It was made from 2008 to 2009, but it had a short run. It was literally the ultimate 5070 mm -hmm. because the platinum model was the last of the regular production series. It's the only time you're gonna see the combination of the white metal case with the blue dial. And it was the last of the 5070s, so also the last of the Lamagna powered Patek mm -hmm. chronos. I like the fact that it is just a manual wind chrono. It's the heir to the 1463, and there was a big gap between the late 60s, early 70s phase out of the 1463 and the 1998 arrival of the yellow gold, the first version of this. But this is a watch that, in my opinion, is beautifully flawed because you've got this stepped pagoda-like bezel. Mm -hmm. You've got these concentric scales of seconds, fractions of seconds in the tachymeter. And then you've got these close-hauled registers that reveal just how small the movement is in mm -hmm. relation to the case. But there's something beautiful about that because this was the swan song of Patek bringing in others as a collaborator. La Magna developed this movement with Omega in the early 40s. It flew to the moon as the Omega 321, and this was really one of its last calls in the industry. Vacheron still uses it, mm -hmm. but it's a scarcity these days in high horology form. So to see it finish the way Patek does, overcoil, free sprung, 60 hour reserve, Geneva hallmark, even that feels a little bit antiquated because Patek itself doesn't do that anymore. These are just really special watches from a bygone era. Granted, you know, it was a, less than a decade and a half ago, but it feels like it was a century. Uh, you won't see its like again. And that's why I think that when the Saatchi Gallery exhibition in London in 2015 brought back discontinued references, mm -hmm. the most exciting thing for me was that they did a handful of 5070 they revivals. They did, and you know what? Back when this watch was being produced, it was big for the time, right? Huge. You know, at 42 millimeters, it was huge. Um, 
And especially during a time in which most of the other complicated watches within the collection were probably around 37 millimeters. So very big for the time. I mean, I love the watch. I, the only thing is it's a little bit big for my wrist. And so it's one of those watches where for me, it looks so incredible when I'm holding it, but when I put it on, it just feels a little bit too big. I think you need to give it another try because my wrist isn't any bigger than yours and I would wear that all day long. But the watch is absolutely glorious. And, and it's, especially in this configuration, it's by far and away the rarest uh, of the different metals. And the subtlest beauty of this watch, and it's very easy to miss from a distance, is that when you look at the dial, you can see the warmth of the white gold hands and numerals, mm -hmm. and it really contrasts with the blinding white of the platinum case. No, it's just, I mean, I, I, you know, before this episode started, I wanted to trade to bring it over to my camp. Yeah, right. Well, I had to have a chronograph because <laughs> I do floor drills and stretches for my cycling, and I, I need a chronograph. I need a stopwatch. So this scratched that itch. It's, it's that or a lot you know, more. to cook a baked potato or something. <laughs> um, so last but not least, we got the, uh, the big boy on the table, the 5002P. I'll let you hold that bad boy up. So launched in 2001, 12 complications, minute repeater tourbillon, celestial dial on the back. I mean, this watch, when it launched, was the most complicated watch in Patek's collection. And it remained that way until the Grandmaster Chime came out. So coming in at just under 43 millimeters, the watch is actually quite wearable, albeit a teeny bit thick. And this was a watch that we've spoken about that was like a changing of the guard for the brand because any sort of watch like this, or I call it complication like this, prior to this watch launching would have been done in a pocket watch. You had the Calibre 89, you had the Henry Graves. Uh, these were watches that were produced in much bigger cases. And in order to shrink it down to this level, it took all of Patek's ingenuity back in 2001 to do this. Yeah, and production was slow. At most, mm -hmm. they could put out 10 of these a year, and that's purely a function of the speed that the watchmaker qualified for those watches Correct. can work. But yeah, like you said, historically, when Patek did a flagship watch, whether it was the complications for Graves and Packard or later on a Calibre 89, the Star Calibre 2000, mm -hmm. it was always a pocket watch. This was the beginning of an era in which Patek began to think of the wristwatch as the image leader. Correct. And that also coincided with the changing of the guard among collectors, whereas back in the 70s and 80s, the first vintage collectors wanted pocket watches. By 2001, the guys who want the ultimate watch, they want to be able to A, use it, mm -hmm. and B, wear it on the wrist. And it's gilding the lily. It's got the Calatrava cross motif engraved on the flank. Uh, misconception is that it's a reversible watch. It's not. Grandmaster Chime is. They fixed that later on. But it does have two dials. Mm -hmm. On the back, moon face, star chart, lunation. On the front, retrograde perpetual calendar. Inside, a real dying breed of interior tourbillon regulators that you can't see. It's there for... It's there for chronometry, it's Correct. not there for peacocking. And then of course you've got a wonderful minute repeater that is uh, beautifully paced and sonorous and fine. It's not necessarily the loudest in platinum, but the mass of the metal gives it a beauty that is rare and worth the effort to hear it. And I think that Should we really, give it a play? Uh, yeah, absolutely. You know what? In, in order to fire it up, here's the thing. I, I would like to set these to 1259 because if you are setting your minute repeater, 1259 is going to give you 12 hours. It's going to give you three quarters after the hour. And then 59, you get 14 chimes. And I'm going to do my best to set this precisely because it can be a little bit difficult. I'd rather do 13 chimes by accident than roll over to one o'clock and get one chime. I'm going to do my best here. Ah, I got it. Still got it. I got the knack. It's an incredible watch. And you know, the amazing thing is it, these got a lot bigger with the 6002. Mm -hmm. And it, look, I mean, my wrist is very small. This is not beyond the realm of reason. It's a watch you want to be seen in. It's not something that you disagree with. No, I mean, you're, you're not, exactly. I mean, you're not looking to hide this timepiece if you're wearing it. But again, at 42.8 or 9 millimeters, whatever it is. I mean, de definitely wearable Yeah, watch. compared to a 6002 or a Grandmaster Chime, you can actually put this on your wrist and enjoy it. I also like how the, the, the activator to the minute repeater 
is sort of hidden in the side on the left, but also visually engraved the same way as it is oh, on yeah. the other side of the case. And it, it has the same color of a cross cut into the dial. It is absolutely beyond belief gorgeous. You have multiple overlaid sapphires creating the star chart on the back. It, it, I mean, beefy as hell. You can see the straps are held on by screws and bars. The lugs are stepped out dramatically. It just has presence with a capital yeah. P. And Look, there will always be a more complicated watch someday, mm -hmm. but if you've been on that list of ultimate, you know, it's like having at one point held the record for the fastest mile. Even if you're not at the top of the list, you will always be on the list, and this is an all-timer in that regard. Yeah, and I think just in terms of like, call it like watch vernacular, like the, just the term sky moon, like collectors, clients, like they know exactly what it is you're referring to and like what it stands for within the watch universe. Yeah, and I really do think it's important, you know, your collection here, you have the ultimate complication, but then at the same time, no less a Patek Philippe, you have the most basic and elemental mm -hmm. watch in the catalog. And that's the great thing about the brand. You can take it as far as you want, but if you just want a taste, you don't get a lesser Patek for only having dipped your toes into the water. Exactly. Okay, so Brian, I wouldn't trade you my 5070p here, but now I'm gonna give you first selection. Perfect. Uh, you can choose from these six, which one do you make yours? And it's gotta be just one. I've been wearing a lot of simple watches recently. Um, I'm wearing a 3738 uh, rose right now. And just sort of given this direction, I'm going gonna go with the 5196 Platinum. All right, now I made this tough for myself because I had practical considerations. This is the most useful watch as mm -hmm. I see it. This is probably the most durable, but this is the one that pulls at my heartstrings. This is the great manipulator. And ultimately, that is the reason we buy these, if you cut straight to the heart of it. So, so yeah, my heart is pledged the 5070p, but here's the thing, ask me tomorrow and I'll change my mind. That's the great thing about Patek. It is perpetual, it is endless.